Call me a wimp, but I prefer to work on my cars indoors. The Hyundai sat for the last half of winter. It's been giving me some minor electrical problems since I got it, but lately it's gotten worse. I'd love to have a four-car garage so that I didn't have to shuffle projects around, but I don't have that luxury. Several times recently, this Hyundai left me stranded, unable to start after short trips. It's okay because I needed the exercise, but since it runs fine once it's started, I know it's not the alternator. Something's wrong with the charging setup on this battery relocation job. It was wired with a four gauge main that's been getting really hot. I felt like that behavior was a little odd. There appears to be a second wire leading back here, and it's apparently the long alternator run. A heavy gauge fine stranded copper speaker wire was used. But that could explain some of the heat. That kind of wire isn't supposed to be used for high amperage applications. There would be too much resistance. You can see the fuse is blown, and that explains why the battery keeps dying. I found another problem up front and it's going to require parts that I don't have, but it contributes to the problem found in the trunk. We'll get to whatever that is later. For now we're just going to blame this on the squirrels. Electrical problems are not why I came out here today. I came out here to fix a performance and not a reliability problem. I came out here to fix the clutch. It just turns to goo if you're not in the right RPM range in the proper gear. If you can maintain that sweet spot, you can keep the front passenger wheel spinning and smoking for as long as you want. But once you get lazy and get it wrong, the whole clutch just turns to goo. When that happens, all your fun is done. I'm sure it's affecting the acceleration because between all the tire smoke and torque steer, I can feel it slipping. I've already had my hard knocks working in gravel driveways, on city streets, during a blizzard, and even the 105 degree summers. Maybe I'm just getting old. I'll take a flat, clean slab of concrete out of the elements any day, all day long. Not just for comfort, but for safety. Aside from this update, everything in this video is stuff that I've done before in detail, but on an all-wheel drive second generation GSX. This car has the same engine, but the transmission is front wheel drive. I don't have to mess with the transfer case, and I don't need to unbolt the jack shaft for the driver's side front axle. Aside from that, the torque specifications, fasteners, seals, and service parts are all the same unless otherwise noted. You first remove the intake, upper intercooler pipe, and any vacuum lines that are in your way. It took me all of five seconds to get dirty. I like to start with the shift linkage. It doesn't matter what gear it's in or anything, just use channel locks or a pry bar to remove the shift cable bracket clips and needle nose pliers for the cotter pins and the end links. When you're done with that, move the shift cables out of your way. Now you have easy access to extract the Squirrel IEDs, which stands for Incognito Edible Delicacies. Sometimes their irresistible penchant for hiding food is counterproductive. With those things out of the way, remove the speedometer cable or sensor. Now to remove the axles. After you get the wheel out of the way, there's little difference in the process here. 32mm axle nut which should have a cotter pin. 1G lower ball joints face up. 2G ball joints face down. The 2G has a trailing arm that you don't have to remove and a strut fork that's bolted to the lower control arm. 1G cars don't have these parts, but on a 2G you just remove the lower fork bolt to separate the strut from the lower control arm. A properly installed lower ball joint should put up a fight. I never use a pickle fork unless I'm replacing the boots on the lower ball joint because a pickle fork just destroys them. The best method I've always had success with is to lift the hub assembly to load up the front suspension and hit the side of the lower ball joint with a hammer. Work on one side, then the other. It loosens up the tapered parts, and the loaded suspension helps them pop apart. Once the hub is loose, pull the outer axle joint free from the hub. I have some axle plugs left over from a transmission purchase. I'm glad I saved these. Use a small pry bar to pop the axle out of the center differential. Rather than draining the gear oil, I'm just going to plug up the seals. If you don't drain the gear oil, you'll leak a little bit out. Clean up any oil that's spilled, and move on to the other side. These security lug nuts are terrible. I hate them. The key fits loose and causes torque loss and heats up the socket as it bounces around. I just wanted you to see that this cordless impact still makes short work of rusty seized lug nuts and has no problem with axle nuts either. Normally I use air tools for this. I put axle lug nuts and washers back on the wheel studs so I don't kick them around while I'm working. 
always clean up your spills immediately. Always have rags handy. It makes life easier later with the kitty litter. There are a few more things connected up top that you should pay attention to. There's a ground wire that's bolted to the passenger frame rail. I put the bolts back in the frame rail so they don't get mixed up in all the others. There's a reverse switch that we unplugged earlier. They love to get broken, and they always do if you don't remove them prior to pulling the transmission. A deep well 24mm socket is needed here. Put it somewhere that it'll stay clean and safe. This car's coolant overflow system hangs over the transmission mount, so I'm going to move that out of the way first. But before we take any of the mounts loose, I'm going to remove the clutch hydraulics. It's a piece of cake. Two bolts. The only thing you should look out for is not to let the rubber boot and the push rod separate from the cylinder. If you do, it will leak hydraulic fluid everywhere and allow air into the clutch lines. Now we just need to remove the transmission mount, the starter, and the bell housing bolts. We already know how bolts work. Note that one of the starter bolts has a ground wire on it. After the starter bolts are out, crawl under the car and remove the crankwalk bolt. If you don't, you won't get the transmission out without breaking the bell housing. Pull the starter free from the flywheel. Now remove the rest of the bell housing bolts. At this stage, nothing is connected to the chassis or the engine. The transmission is simply hanging on the dowel pins in the input shaft. Don't pull it free without something under it to catch the weight. It's 132 pounds and can crush you. I use a floor jack and a block of wood. A pry bar helps to separate it easily and the best pry spot is across the bottom of the bell housing against anything solid on the firewall. Next, I'm pulling out the old factory spec stock clutch. What's not factory spec is the flywheel in here. It was cut to a 610 thousandth step height in preparation for a different ACT clutch. This variation caused the friction point to be all the way up at the top of the pedal and the clutch clamping force to be very light. Just to prove that the six bolt and seven bolt clutch parts don't matter, I'm gonna use the clutch that I had on my GSX in the Hyundai. It's an ACT MB10 Extreme 2600 pressure plate and I'm going to use the same almost new street disc as well. I don't think the GSX will need this once I'm done with it. I like to give a used clutch and flywheel a quick pass with a Scotch-Brite pad using light pressure just to leave a lightly honed surface on both the flywheel and the pressure plate. You need a Ford 20 clutch alignment tool. Slap the pressure plate on there and I like to run the clutch bolts down a quarter turn at a time by hand making sure nothing's binding up. I use a big socket because it's easier to grip. Next I go around the clutch bolts in a star pattern until they're all flush. Clutch bolts get only 14 foot-pounds of torque. Torque them in a star pattern and when you're done, remove the clutch alignment tool. Normally I just put the transmission back in but when I sold this transmission years ago, it was filthy. And now I have it back with all my old original grease and dirt on it, plus some new hydraulic spills from the leaky slave cylinder. If I'm going to keep working on this car, this thing needs some serious decontamination first. It's important to plug up all the holes where water can get into the transmission, so I'm putting the reverse switch back in, masking off the speed sensor hole, and making sure the axle plugs are firmly seated in the differential. I've never gotten as dirty as I have doing this job on any other car I've ever owned, and I had to do something about it. It's really important to thoroughly dry the transmission because there are a lot of untreated cast iron parts that will rust. 
As soon as it's dry, I clean up the fork and the throwout bearing. There's no grit in the bearing, and it's not crushed, so I'm putting the same one back in here. Apply grease to the fork and reassemble it. Grease the inside of the throwout bearing. Grease the pivot ball, the input shaft, and the sleeve. Install the clutch fork assembly. I didn't shim the pivot ball because the fork rested in a good position in the fork hole. Also, the high friction point in the pedal could be raised even higher by doing this. So I'm hoping the correct clutch for this step height actually moves the pedal's friction point back down to where it should be. Only time spent finishing this installation will tell. I use the long starter bolts as guide bolts for the top of the bell housing and pry the transmission back onto the block against the inner frame rail. Use a rag between the pry bar and the frame if you care about scratching the paint. I don't care, would you? Run all the transmission bolts down. On a 1G, there's only four. They get 35 foot-pounds. Pass yourself the starter. Install the crank walk bolt. It gets 22 foot-pounds. Screw in your speedometer cable. Install the starter bolts. Make sure you hook your ground wire back up. The starter bolts get 25 foot-pounds. Next we have the transmission mount bolts. They get 43 to 58 foot-pounds. Same goes for the center bolt that joins the two halves of the transmission mount together. Put your shift cables back in the brackets with the clips we pulled out early on in this job. This is the finishing stretch. Install your shift cable end links with the washers and always use new cotter pins. Reinstall your reverse switch with its aluminum crush washer and torque it to 22 to 25 foot-pounds. Plug in the electrical harness. I'm done over here, so I'm going to put the coolant overflow bottle back where it goes. Don't forget to bolt your ground wire back down. Put your intake assembly and upper intercooler pipe back on. This is usually easy if it's just all factory 1G rubber hoses and snorkels with worm gear clamps. It works fine on a turbo eclipse, so it's good enough for my Hyundai. Reattach your breather lines, fix all the ones that have been leaking, reconnect the blow off valve. Reconnect the bypass tube. Put your axles back in and your hub assemblies back together. Use new cotter pins on your axle nuts. Putting a floor jack under the rotor and loading up the suspension helps you honk down the lower ball joint nuts. 
Now for that nasty, pesky, leaky slave cylinder. Get a pan for the fluids you're going to leak. You don't need the lower fitting if your new slave cylinder came with the right one. But if you've removed the slave from the transmission, you'll need the right pliers to grip it with. A standard open-end wrench may strip the small fitting on the line, so you're supposed to use a line fitting wrench. I found that most 10mm line fitting wrenches jaws spread and slip, still leaving you able to strip the fitting. If this happens to you, grab two pairs of vice grips and install them offset for the direction you need to turn the fitting. Then you just grab both pairs of vice grips and squeeze. Pop comes right off, no stripping. The fluid in the reservoir looked nasty, so I'm going to let it drain. I've covered this part in depth already. I'm going to bench bleed the slave so that it's completely full of fluid when I install it on the car. The 10 minutes this takes can save you a half hour of hard work. Now to install the slave. Install the clutch line and the two bolts that attach it to the bell housing. These bolts get between 11 and 16 foot-pounds. When you compress the slave cylinder to attach it to the bell housing, fluid inside the cylinder will be forced up into the clutch line, and any remaining air bubbles in the slave cylinder with it, hopefully. So, now you just crack the bleeder screw open and fill the reservoir, letting gravity take effect. Make sure all of your other fittings are tight beforehand. Once you have a steady stream of hydraulic fluid running out, close the bleeder screw. This method just allowed me to bleed the clutch without anyone else's help and with no pumping. Just wanted you to see that this was possible without any special tools that you can't make for yourself. Check for clutch preload by pressing the fork towards the driver's side. If you forgot the dust boot, you can pull the push rod free from the fork and wiggle it in there. No need to unbolt anything. There, I'm done. Now I'm going to move on to the electrical problem, but first I need to order some parts. I can't wait to see how the old GSX clutch works in the Hyundai, but not anxious enough to end up stranded anywhere with a dead battery. I'm long overdue for having a car leaving this garage under its own power. Thanks for watching, guys. Feel free to comment and stay tubed.